make sure everyone is joined before we kick off with our presentations. All right, welcome everyone to our July 2024 Pasture Quality Webinar, The Riverina. I am Brianna Hattie. I'm currently in the Graduate Extension and Advisory role with the NRM team. And I'm joined by Carrie Evans, the Sustainable Ag Graduate Advisor, Michael Campbell, who is the Sustainable Agricultural Team Leader, and Emily Stearman, the District Vet for The Riverina. Before we start today, I would like to acknowledge that we are all dialing in from what always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I pay my respects to the Wiradjuri people who are the traditional custodians of the land and waters on which I'm meeting today and also extend that to the traditional custodians you are all representing today as well as elders past, present and emerging. Today our team will firstly provide you with some insights into why pasture sampling is an important part of livestock production. The results from our July 2024 pasture samples and some of the trends and surprises we came across. Michael will then discuss how we can make better decisions on farm to improve productivity. And finally, Emily will give us an update on animal health in the Riverina and some things to keep an eye on in the coming season. To finish off, we will open up the room to any questions you may have for our presenters. Before we kick things off, I would quickly like to go through some housekeeping. Your microphones will be turned off for the duration of the presentations. However, you will be given opportunity at the end of the webinar to ask any questions you may have. We will also be recording this webinar for future use. If you do think of any questions whilst the presentations are taking place, please feel free to use the Q&A function to jot down any questions or comments. If you have joined us via a computer or laptop, simply click the Q&A button in the top left toolbar and type your questions in there. If you're watching via a phone, you should be able to click the three dots at the bottom of your screen or slide up the toolbar, select more options, and then click on the Q&A button to begin typing out your question. I will now pass it over to Carrie, who will take us through pasture sampling, its benefits, and what results are most important when analysing pastures, pasture sample reports. Um, okay, so why do we test pastures? Well, not all grass is the same. Some grass is in fact better than other grass. Testing pastures allows us to quantify what we see in the paddock and determine whether pasture is as good as it looks. Many of you will have seen this figure from the ProGraze manual, and we all know that plants lose quality as they mature, but it's always good to validate what we think the results might be and see if they actually are. Having quality information helps us to make better informed decisions, such as matching classes of stock to paddocks, whether to supplementary feed or not, or whether a protein or non-protein nitrogen supplement might be effective. It's also important to remember that there is a margin of error with this type of sampling and that pasture quality changes quickly. In a mixed pasture, animals should also selectively graze at a higher quality than the samples that we've tested. Um, where did we test? So we've tried to test at a range of locations across the entire Riverina so that something you see today should hopefully look similar to something that you have at home. And here's a map of all the locations that we sampled. Um, so which results are important? And what do the numbers actually mean? The dry matter is what's left after all of the water is removed from a substance. In livestock feed, the dry matter includes all of the essential nutrients, such as energy, protein, minerals, and vitamins. Dry matter analysis allows us to compare across feed stuff as the water is removed so that we can look at the nutrients available. If the percentage of dry matter is too low, it means that there is too much water in the feed. This can limit the amount of nutrients the animals consume because water still takes up space in the rumen without providing any nutritional value. On the other hand, if the dry matter percentage is too high, it means the feed is too dry. This can reduce how well the feed is digested and the overall amount that the animals will consume. Next, we have neutral detergent fibre. This is the amount of fibre in the feed sample, including components like cell walls and structural materials. 
If there's too much fibre, it can be slow to break down in the rumen, which may reduce how well the feed's digested and limit the amount of feed the animal consumes each day. Conversely, if there is too much little fibre, the feed may pass through the rumen too quickly, preventing the animal from absorbing all of the nutrients. If the NDF level is below 30%, it may be a good idea to add roughage to the diet to slow down the rate of passage. Digestibility is a measure of utilisation. Here is an example of a 70% digestible pasture. In this example, if the sheep consumes one kilo of the pasture, 700 grams is utilised and 300 grams is excreted. Metabolizable energy is probably the most important measurement as it is often the factor that limits growth. All animals require a base level of energy. This is known as maintenance energy. This is the energy that maintains their weight and keeps them alive. Any weight gain or wool growth requires additional energy on top of this. The requirement is also increased during pregnancy and lactation. Finally, crude protein is another important measurement. Rumen microbes need protein as a feed source to help them break down the fibrous component of feed. They also use the protein to produce all of the amino acids that the animal requires. Generally, the minimum protein level required in feed is 7%. However, during stages like lactation, pregnancy and rapid growth, animals need higher levels of protein. Protein is essential for producing milk and for muscle growth. Generally, anything over 18% is excess and this is excreted. We will now go through our results from our pasture testing. Here are some of the native pastures that we tested in the Western region. I don't think we did the South Hay paddocks justice when sampling as there was a lot of medic and annual winter grasses actively growing. Since everything is measured based on dry matter, the proportion of dry matter in the dead grass compared to the fresh green growth likely skewed the results. It is also important to remember that cattle and even more so sheep are selective grazers. Therefore, at a more conservative stocking rate, livestock would select the more nutritious and digestible green growth and therefore would do better than these results suggest. The pasture at Maud would have significant waste loss without supplementation. There was a much lower medic germination in this paddock, so this result makes sense. For the pasture at Bulligal, it would maintain a dry cow, but sheep may struggle maintaining weight. The sample on the right taken at Bulligal was taken from a rehabilita rehabilitated clay pan with a mix of annual grasses, saltbush and shrubs, mainly pioneer species, although the old man saltbush was planted about two years ago. The great results from these samples at Bulligal demonstrate that animals consuming a varied diet should meet their nutritional requirements. The first three pastures are from the same property at Carathal. As you can see, there is a significant difference between the first and second results much lower digestibility, energy and protein. This is potentially due to there being more mature tussock summer grass and this outcompeting the medic winter growing annuals. You can see in these photos that there is more dried grass and less fresh growth. This highlights the difference in quality between pastures, between the two pastures that look similar at first glance. The first and third are great native pastures. Both of these native pastures have very low protein and energy. The stock in Tomorrow were being supplemented and the native pasture in Tulimba is in the same paddock as a dual purpose grazing crop. However, this could be representative of quite a lot of native pastures in the area and is a good reminder that an unfertilized native pasture with very little young growth or legume like this will result in weight loss of dry stock and is definitely not adequate for actively growing or pregnant lactating stock. Here is a summary of the native pastures that were sampled. We will send out a full result table, so don't stress about the individual numbers today. On the right side of the table, Carrie has calculated the maximum dry matter intake for a 450 kilo dry cow and a 50 kilo dry sheep. The results also indicate whether this intake meets their maintenance requirements. Values highlighted in red show instances where intake does not meet the maintenance needs for dry stock. During lactation and rapid growth, these requirements double, and during pregnancy, they increase by at least 30%. Consequently, most of these pastures would not support the nutritional needs of lactating or pregnant animals. 
Some of the key messages that come from the native pasture results include that there is a mix of quality with some pastures resulting in high growth rates and others only meeting maintenance levels at best. Therefore, we would want to allocate different class of stock depending on the pasture. We were fortunate enough to sample a property in Adelong with an Optiway. The heifers grazing this paddock have grown an average of 300 grams a day over the last three weeks. The test results from our pasture samples support the findings of the Optiway, despite the pasture appearing to be good when we visited. Whilst this pasture is fine for maintenance, it is not achieving the desired growth rates. This is due to the lower digestibility and energy. Because of the lower digestibility and higher fibre content, animals cannot consume enough of the pasture to gain large amounts of weight. Similarly, the pasture sampled at Mandalo appeared to be pretty good, but actually had low digestibility and energy for improved pasture. We don't have growth rates for this paddock, but we can assume that livestock would be doing similar. Um, just a reminder that maintenance energy required for a 450 kilo cow is 53 megajoules a day and based off this there is very little leftover energy for growth with either of these two scenarios. It is suggested that animals require double for high growth rates and obviously this is not double 53. We sampled four loosen or clover based pastures and all of them had good results. Both pure swords of lucerne were very high protein, but as they were young and actively growing, this is to be expected. For increased protein utilisation, offering roughage to stock as well could improve the protein to fibre balance. Both pastures at Tilimba were well balanced in terms of legume and grass, and both had good protein. The lower energy in the fourth sample here is likely due to the imbalance in dry matter of the grass, thus clover and animals would probably selectively graze at a higher quality than 8.5 megajoules. The rose clover and clover looked great. Um, all of these ryegrass pastures look great and tested well. Um, and livestock on these pastures should see good growth rates. Um, these semi-improved pastures have all come off of a few months' rest due to the low rainfall in the eastern Riverina. Mostly these pastures were predominantly annual grasses like barley grass with really good clover germination. The pastures have high digestibility and good amounts of energy and protein. This is probably due to them being young and actively growing. It's good for people to know that the quality is there in these pastures as it seems to be similar to what a lot of people have at home. Once again, we will send out the full results to your emails. But the key takeaway here is that although all these pastures are adequate for maintenance, there is a lot of variability in the digestibility and energy. Some of the pastures which appear to be good quality were not as good as they seemed. We can utilise these results to help us match classes of stock with different requirements to the best suited pasture. Both paddocks of vetch came back with great results. The vetch at Brushwood currently has lambs on it, which are growing at 340 grams per day, which are great results for the landholders. Similarly, the vetch at Tulimba was very impressive. As you can see, based on the photo of the ruler, it was up to our knees and would easily meet maintenance requirements for stock. However, it hasn't been stocked since planting. The vetch at Tulimba is vulgar variety and was sown on the 27th of March with 50 kilograms per hectare MAP. Fortunately for them, they have had great rainfall since the beginning of the year, which has helped enormously with its growth. Both of these vetch mix mixtures at Brushwood and Grogan tested really well and looked great with very uniform growth across the paddock. At Brushwood, they had hoggets grazing on it at the time of sample and at Grogan, they had lambs grazing it. Stock would perform well on both these paddocks due to the high levels of ME, crude protein and digestibility. The mixture at Kulak was sown in early spring and had cows grazing it at the time the samples were taken. The peas were really the star of the show in this paddock, having grown really well amongst other species. 
The canola loosened clover mix at Grogan was sown in April and has not yet been grazed. It had an NDF of 26.5, so if you were to be grazing it, you could potentially look at adding a good quality roughage to try and slow down the passage of feed in the rumen and balance nutrients such as nitrate in the canola. The wheat paddock in Talimpa, which is Illabo variety, has only had a small focus block of sheep on it over the last month. It was sown on the 29th of March with 60 kilograms of MAP and a later spreading of 100 kilos of urea. Testing has shown that it has very low NDF and very highly just digestibility. It also came back with the highest energy levels from all of the samples we took in July. Fortunately, this paddock has an adjoining hill with native pasture, which provides them with some roughage that the animals can selectively graze to ensure they get enough fibre. The oats at Yavin Creek had great results also. Two paddocks of the same variety were tested at Yavin Creek, one which has been used primarily for grazing and one which has been cut for hay multiple times since planting and has not yet been grazed. We were interested to see if this would have an impact on the pasture quality. However, the results came back very similar, highlighting that minimal nutritional value was lost after being cut for hay. Here is the table for all of the forages tested across the region. As you can see, all samples contain enough energy to maintain dry stock. We would have expected all of these to have similar results, but as you can see here, there is some variation. This highlights that there is always variations across plants and paddocks and the value of doing pasture testing. These shrubs do provide a valuable protein and energy source for stock, especially when summer grasses have become mature and less digestible or during dry periods. A landholder was interested in the potential nutritional value of the goose foot. So it's very interesting to see that it's actually highly digestible with a good amount of protein and energy, another valuable shrub for the livestock to include as part of their diet. Finally, here's the table of all the shrub samples around the hay area. If this has inspired you to test your own pastures or supplementary feed at home, you can pick up a collection kit from your local LLS office or order a collection kit from the DPI website. Alternatively, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch with myself or Brianna. Thank you, Carrie. We'll now pass it over to Michael Campbell. Michael joined our team at the start of the year and has a wealth of knowledge across many different agricultural systems due to his varied work and research, which he has taken part in over a number of decades. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Bree, and thanks, Carrie. I think um, we can all agree that you two have done a great job on um, getting these samples and first ever a webinar, getting it organised for us. So that's... Um, really appreciate it. You've done an excellent job and a great presentation. I think um, I'm sitting here listening to it thinking I've got a whole range of questions and I'm going to hit you up with afterwards around some of those results and how they actually um, fit into different people's systems. So, so I thought I, what I would uh, just, I, I really wanted to stimulate discussion um, for you, for anyone online to have with their um, business partners, husbands, wives, friends at home, um, because we don't actually, I, I can't help you make decisions exactly on your farm with your situation um, without knowing it and without coming out to visit. So I just sort of take you through a bit of a process of thinking that I'm going through at the moment myself and um, and how we might address it as a team in terms of our extension over the next uh, little period of time. So first of all, I sort of thought we'd, we'd have a look at um, what, what are we looking at for rainfall coming out of uh, winter and into spring? And if, um, if we look at the uh, the Bureau, and I know there's a whole range of sites everyone can look at, and essentially what I go to is, well, the Bureau is our, our mainstay um, and, and sort of, uh, you know, probably our most, you know, where we can go to as a consistent source of information. What it shows us here is the, um, the potential for rainfall in September and rainfall in October. Now, I've got this set to a 75% chance of these events happening. So it's a fairly high um, chance, a low risk sort of approach. And um, you can see in our eastern country, we're sort of into those those green areas, which is putting us 25 mils to 50 mils of rain. Um, and then, then as we go further west the, through the Riverina, we're down to that 10 mils plus event in each in both September and October. So what does that mean? It means that there is a prediction of, of some rainfall for coming in this next little um, period of time. If we look closer to home in the next 
one week and two weeks time is that um is, is that we actually there is some bit of rain predicted for the uh the eastern part of our area eastern part of the riverina somewhere in that sort of 10 to, to 20 mil event um that, that uh, has a chance of occurring um between now and september and as we get closer to those events we obviously get more more surety around that so then if we take into consideration that we're looking that we will get some level of rainfall i know soil moisture in some areas and it's, it's really varied across our region we've got and actually opposite to what we normally have is that we've got lots of feed um, and a fair bit of soil moisture to the to the west and it's probably worse in our in our eastern in our eastern part of the region and so what we need to start thinking about is based on all those feed test results that we've just seen how we actually allocate paddocks based on requirements so what I guess my point here is to, to highlight that we need to start thinking about the the classes of stock we have. So coming out of winter, oftentimes we can um, we can mob up uh, livestock together because especially in a spring calving situation because we've got dry stock and um, pregnant stock um, that that can be run together. Now it's time to start thinking. Well, what condition are my cows in um, as they start to carve, and do they need to be gaining weight or are they okay? And the uh, the obvious one for me is around our heifers coming into spring. Will our heifers actually hit our our mating weight targets? So we talk about a critical mating weight being you know sixty percent of mature body weight. If if we've got a five fifty kilo cow, that's about your three hundred and thirty kilo heifer. Um, and everyone will know what their cows are, how big their cows are, so we can sort of work on that. Now that's a critical weight, um, not not an ideal weight as such. So we, if we if we need our heifers to be three hundred and fifty kilos or plus, and they're only sitting, I was I just checked before on Auctions Plus today. There's there's plenty of heifers that are sitting around that two fifty kilos. That's a hundred kilos of weight gain. Now in the eastern part of the region, they can definitely gain that um, quite quickly in um, September, October, if we're joining in November for, for an August, September calf. But if we're joining earlier than that, we might need to start thinking about supplementing those heifers to get them up to weight. Um, and we've seen just then, if we think our pastures look good, but they're actually a bit less quality than what we um, what we think they are, then they, we may not be able to support that kilo of day, a kilo gain per day that is needed in the example on the slide here. Um, in some instances, we might be needing to do, get 1.2 kilos a day, therefore we might have to supplement. Other circumstances, we're, 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 we're cruising through and we're okay. Um, in my mind, in our in the eastern part of the region compared to the western part, is we're probably the most uh, and out of all the, these results, the probably the biggest limiting factor is going to be the quantity of food. Um, so understanding that cattle um, can only uh, are limited more in terms of the height of the pasture than sheep are. Um, and so on on this slide here, I just wanted to highlight, and, and, and many of you will have seen those MLA pasture rulers that are around, um, and, and we see that many of our pastures in the, in the eastern part of the region are, are down below that 1,000 kilos of dry matter at the moment. Some, some are starting to get away, and you can see that's when we start limited intake um, for, for uh, cattle. And I think what it highlights here, if I, I just want to go back to a, a, the previous slide where we, we looked at a phalaris, it was eight megajoules of, of energy and the heifers were growing at 300 grams a day. And this is kind of supported in this slide for, for animals to be growing or for heifers to be growing at 0.6 of a kilo per day, they really need to be having higher quality food and, and more of it. So 1600 kilos, which puts us at that sort of six centimetres height um, in our pastures. So it's just important to remember this. And, and if we don't have the, 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 the quantity of food ahead of our, especially our lactating females, our um, lactating cows, and a bit around our lactating sheep, they, they can obviously eat lower to the ground, then we may have to be looking at some sort of supplementation just in this early part of spring um, and then see how the season goes. Um, and this is the this is the paddock I was talking about. So I, I'm um, I, I was jealous of looking at these these photos because I definitely don't have any food like this at home myself. Um, but it does highlight that we what we need to be thinking about is the quality and quantity of food in each paddock and allocation of stock to those. Um, and so you know if we need our heifers to be growing more than 300 grams a day, or our steers if they're going to uh, you know, a certain market, um, or our cows if we need them to be gaining weight, and the same with our um, twin and single bearing ewes. Um, we, we just have to think about what paddocks we want to allocate them to. So I really encourage people if you um, if you if you haven't tested a part of some of your pastures in a, in a period of time to to think about pasture testing um, for, for quality. It does change regularly, but it gives us a, a bit of an indication of what's going on in those paddocks. 
Um, if you're not testing for pastures, then measuring animal production is, is the best way to do it. And that's where the use of the Opti weighs. And any sort of in-paddock weighing system comes into its own is because you get an immediate um, measure of actually what the quality of food is doing based on those classes of stock. Um, now, before I before I uh, finish up and hand over, I just want to highlight a few things going on here. Um, is that the, the, we do actually have a project, the Farming Forecaster project. Some of you will have uh, heard about it, and there's a website out there. So the fa um, pa Farm Forecaster website, farmingforecaster.com.au. And um, on this screen, I just want to highlight the first one you come to in the Riverina page is uh, is Adelong, which is uh, obviously where where I live, and it's not biased. It's just the first one that comes to comes up on the on the list. Um, and you can see here this black line that shows where our pasture growth has been sitting over the last little bit of time. So we're still quite low, you know, 1,000 kilos of dry matter on the model. So this is this is modelled out of grass grow, and uh, and we will be running more um, field days and uh, and webinars around this as we get the soil moisture probes in the ground. So we still don't have the soil moisture probes in all our location, but we do have the the, the locations being modelled by grass grow. And what you can see here, my, this my take home message out of this this figure is the um, is that we we've tracked along here at the black line. If we actually get a few rainfall events, we can have a cracking year. We can still be in the top, um, you know, twenty percent of years in this uh, in this green space. If we have a few um, missed rainfall events, so a bit of a drier period um, through August and September, we can actually drop off off the cliff. So as we know, pretty much every year we're at this decision point, um, start of spring, uh, and that's where we need to make the decision. We need to get comfortable in our own businesses as to what's our stocking rate looking like at the moment, where where are the markets. Um, and what do we have on hand in terms of supplementary food or, or the potential to grow more food um, in our systems? So we'll know more in this next next 30 days. Um, I'm, I'm hoping not everyone's expecting me to come up with a, with an answer for them today, um, but we're sitting here right, right at the cuffs um, of either a really great season, uh, uh, an average, or, a, or, or it could be worse. If I just click on this link, will that show up on the webinar yeah, or not? Yeah. So if I just I just quickly share this um, with everybody, that one there, terrific. And this one, yeah, terrific. <laughs> I'm getting some control over it. So we um, we have the farming forecaster website here. This is why I get Carrie and Browner to help me out a lot. Um, the Farming Forecaster website here. So I'll, I just wanted to highlight that um, there's a few things on here that um, that, that are valuable for, for other for, for everyone to have a look at, I suppose. So if I just pick a different location, so our locations are up on the right-hand side here. If I pick a different location, so if we actually go out to, um, out to the rock here, we can see that it's a slightly different um, scenario out of the rock as to where we can end up. So we're, we're still not at the top of the years. If we get a bit of rainfall event, we can still definitely end up with a good spring. And that's a constant, you know, a few more showers of, of rain and a, um, we end up in a, in a good season. But we can, we, we're still in a position here that we can actually be uh, dropping off. Now we start looking at risk profiles around rainfall events, etc. If we want to get some more detail, you just click on the, the, the more pasture detail tab, which I just clicked on, and it tells us about the system that's been modelled. And then we can actually obviously look at the, the same figure again um, and some other interesting figures that we that might be interested uh, depend on decisions that we're going to make. Plant available soil soil water. So you can see at the rock here that we're actually um, sitting at uh, 40 mils of plant available soil moisture, uh, a soil water, I should say. Um, and and if we looked at where the, where the best years have been, um, we're looking up here at the top 10 percent. And so that uh, we're actually below, we're probably below our average. And so, and that's pretty, that would be consistent with what people are seeing in the paddock, I think, is that we're, we're below average there. We can look at um, modelled ground cover and then also the um, current condition score of our stock. Now that's an interesting one. So there, this is uh, saying that our condition score is uh, over a three for our females um, based on the modelling. So it's not saying it's an exact number, it's a model. So if you look at other sites, exact, for example, up at Adelong, it's actually telling us that our condition score is about a two, two and a half, which is, um, which is what we're seeing in the paddock. We've had a tougher start to the year than somewhere like the rock. Um, so if I just stop sharing that, that'll take me back to the webinar, won't it? Terrific. Carrie will reshare it. Terrific. 
Sorry, I just wanted to show that the website is actually live and people can, um, and anyone who's coming in from a different region, there's several regions on that farming forecaster site and we are, our soil moisture probes will be going in this next short period of time. Terrific. You want to help me? Can you help me do this one? Terrific. Excellent. And... So I've covered that one here. So this is for this is for Adelong, and you can see that we're we're sitting below average for our um, plant available soil soil water as well at the moment. And so some of the decisions that people are making, um, uh, such as maybe applying urea or something to grow more feed, uh, need to take into consideration how much soil moist, soil water we have. So how do we grow more food? If we need to grow more food, and I said there before, I think our quality is okay. It's actually just how much quantity we've got. Urea is our obvious obvious go-to. The beauty of using urea as we started to come into spring is our, is our response. So best bang for our buck is going to be in springtime, but we have to utilise the food. So you can see that um, the, the slow and moderate responses that we might have had, the five to 10 kilos of dry matter per kilo of nitrogen that we applied, that was in, in winter, um, it, it, that's that's kind of the response that we might have seen. Well, coming into spring, we may see the 50, 15 to 20 kilos of dry matter response. So we can actually get a lot better bang for our buck using urea, but we have to have the stock to utilise it. And I'm sure there's plenty of people around saying, I've got plenty of stock who utilise our grass. Um, up in the eastern, um, part of the world as well in, in the Riverina, thinking about how we can actually carry that, that dry matter into early summer as well um, becomes important for us. I've got on here, and this will come through to everybody, um, the link to Dairy NZ. Um, I was saying to Carrie and Brownie before, oftentimes we stay within our box and we think about uh, how we use urea in the Riverina. Um, the dairy guys use it the best, and especially somewhere like New Zealand who can't, um, who have to limit their their um, nitrogen runoff and um, and leaching and so forth. They're using it very efficiently over there, and some of the best research coming out of those dairy guys. So there's a good link there, a great resource for people to have a look at as well in their own time. I just wanted to highlight here, I mentioned there about uh, cost of urea and growing more food. Um, when we look at the average response of a 10 to 1 here, you'll see on the left hand side table, table 2 here, um, we, we can, it looks like cheap feed if we get 100% utilisation. So at 100, if, we, if we're looking at $700 a tonne for urea, and at the moment it's probably about the $780 a tonne, I think I was quoted yesterday, um, and at a 10 to 1 response, we're looking at $150 per tonne of dry matter. Now, it's not often that we can get 100% utilisation from that extra extra food that we've grown. So at a 75% utilisation, $200 a tonne of dry matter to grow it, still a fair bit cheaper than buying hay in at, at $280 or $300 a tonne um, for not as good a quality feed. So it's important to remember that we need to utilise the feed if we're going to put the urea out and trying to grow it more, um, and that the better response we can have, then the cheaper the feed is. And that's a, that, I mean, that's pretty obvious to most people. We're just putting some numbers around it. Um, what I then wanted to highlight was on the right hand side here in this table five, and this comes out of the um, resource here in the the link um, from Dairy Australia is that our urea that's sitting closer to the $800 a tonne mark, so somewhere between the $600 and $800 a tonne, if we move across here and say, what is the response required to break even on a kilograms of dry matter per unit of N applied? We're only looking at the five to seven um, uh, break even mark at $250 a tonne. If we, if we go back then, we're saying that actually that response in winter, which might have only been five to 10 kilos response is actually cheaper than supplementary feed even in winter. So we can actually take that and say, well, uh, you know, we can grow a lot of feed this early spring period and manage a bit of risk in case it does get a bit drier later on, grow the feed on farm and put it down animal's throat rather than bringing it in. Um, and then we've also got the spring forages. So there's a link here to the to, um, local land services page to think about, well, are there paddocks that I've been feeding on and, and that potentially you could turn into a spring forage paddock. So um, the, the classic ones here are, are sort of your brassicas at the moment, um, but there'll be people looking to, to wait a little bit of time and maybe put a bit of summer forage in, um, and, and that we can see how the spring goes with that. But if you needed to grow more feed, how do we fill this gap? There are those options um, and not to be afraid um, of, of, of over sowing a paddock that you might have, might have uh, impacted by feeding on um, with, with some sort of spring forage. Uh, that, that can fill a gap. Do your sums on it and make sure that it's going to be cheaper than buying supplementary food. So these are all the decisions running through my head and, and think talking with um, uh, other producers at the moment is, uh, other animals are going to hit target weights? So the target weights, obviously, you know, spoke about heifers before, but we've got um, in the in the sheep 
situation here. If we've got spring lamb and ewes, are they going to maintain weight or are they? where are they sitting? Um, are our foodisties going to hit a feedlot weight um, or are we better to shift them and save on a feed cost? Um, th there's a number of scenarios at the moment and, and really we're just in, we're in a bit of a, a holding pattern waiting for, you know, to see where this rainfall comes in the next, next period of time. Um, autumn calves, definitely able to wean those calves now. Anything over that uh, three to four months of age, especially four months of age, um, you can definitely wean those calves and there's a whole range of resources around and happy to give um, a, a chat to anybody who wants to, to discuss that option. Um, and it's a great way to take the pressure off the cows. And then thinking about our paddocks, going back to Brianna and Carrie's work around all the food quality um, uh, testing, is is thinking about what are the best paddocks for the, the right class of stock. And if we don't quite know, grab a feed test, put in the feed lab, and um, and get your you get your result pretty quickly. And you can make some um, probably better strategic decisions about how to best utilise your farm. And then I've just mentioned about how do we, do we need to grow more feed? If we if we don't need to grow feed, don't waste the money on fertiliser. But if you do, urea can be a really cheap source of food um, uh, coming into spring. So that's about it for me. So I just wanted to simulate some discussion. Um, and hopefully if anyone's got any questions, more than happy to talk through any of those concepts. Um, and, and then obviously talk to your local advisors as well. Thank you, Michael. We'll now pass it over to M. Stearman, who is our district vet with LLS, and we'll go through some livestock health within the Riverina. Thanks, Brianna. Uh, just in light of keeping with uh, the theme of uh, using some information to make decisions moving forward through our late winter and spring period, I won't focus too much today on the clinical signs of the diseases we're going to have a chat through, but more around um, what might predispose to those conditions and how you can manage them uh, best with your grazing system. Internal parasites uh, are something I suppose that we're always on the outlook for um, in animal production systems. Uh, in particular, over the last um, month or so, we have started to see high worm egg counts creep back in. Uh, especially to sheep production systems, uh, and whether this is a little bit of carryover from autumn um, comparative to our spring break, um, but certainly something to keep an eye out for as we evolve into spring conditions. So Trucker Strong Guys are our intestinal scour-based worms. The first thing you're going to probably see is um, some loose species around tails of your sheep, but uh, monitoring, I suppose, for that significant rainfall event and an increase in temperatures where we're likely going to see hatching of those egg larvae uh, and subsequently issues in our animals. So drenching decisions uh, always make those based off the back of a worm egg count uh, is, the, is the current recommendation and the most strategic way of utilising your drenches and, and getting some longevity out of them. Our uh, guide, I suppose, from a production perspective, your 200 eggs per gram, you're going to start to see some production losses there. 400 eggs per gram is, is I suppose, that critical point where you, you're going to want to make those decisions because you're definitely seeing a production loss at that point in time. When you're drenching, obviously you're not drenching, like considering what pasture and grazing um, management systems you have in place. So whether you're rotationally grazing, uh, whether you've got particular pastures that are high, um, high or prone to um, high worm egg counts, such as those that you might have lambed onto or weaned onto, and you can graze over the top of those with cattle um, to reduce that worm egg burden or your dry, clean sheep um, in terms of that. Uh, liver fluke in cattle, uh, you know the areas um, around the region um, based on your own management systems on farm that are particularly prone to this one. Uh, it's something that um, I suppose we don't always think of in a dry year. We think of it in a wet year, um, but grazing behaviours change based on those seasons. It's important to know your, your swampy areas, as as like the photo in the bottom right of screen there, uh, do tend to be areas where the snail likes to uh, live and likes to then harbour the right environment for your fluke uh, to be an issue in cattle. So considering in dry years that cattle will uh, eat closer to these areas because they're often the last place to be green uh, with a bit of fresh pick. So considerations to what your season looks like as it evolves through spring as to what risk you may have for fluke, whether that is an increased risk this year based on further spread 
of the snail and the larvae um, because it's a, a, a favourable spring compared to if it does start to dry off. Uh, definitely don't rule that off your list of things to monitor for. Float is one we talk about uh, each year, uh, how long it affects us for and uh, the times in which it affects us vary depending on our season. Um, but it's it's very particular to the type of feed, quality of feed, uh, and I suppose stage of growth. Uh, low fibre within that plant tends to cause the highest risk. Obviously, um, as the girls have indicated from various pasture tests, um, a lot of uh, pasture across the region is quite high in protein and energy, especially when we're looking at crops or legume-based pastures. Uh, a normal rumen function uh, is to have a quite a large liquid portion at the base of the, the rumen where all of the bacteria do the great work. Uh, and as part of that digestion, they're producing a gas component. A good fibre layer over the top of that allows for those gas particles to escape and be belched off um, during rumination. When we have high protein, high energy diets with low fibre, uh, so lush green feeds um, with those um, feed equivalents, uh, we tend to have a high viscous liquid produced in the gut and the, the gas produced by the bacteria as part of normal fermentation can't make it to the top and therefore aren't belched off and that's when we start to see clinical signs of bloat in animals. Uh, when we talk about prevention for that, high energy and high protein is obviously wonderful for all sorts of growth and development, uh, maintaining a healthy uh, pregnancy and, and good calf and lamb weights. Um, but we need to ensure that there's appropriate fibre. So whether that be monitoring the levels of maturity in our plants uh, with additional fibre supplementation or considering fibre supplementation as a, as a primary consideration. Grazing behaviour is really important. Uh, a lot of people don't think of bloat being an issue that affects sheep, um, but we certainly see a lot of it here around the Wagga region. Sheep are particularly dexterous with a smaller muzzle uh, width and they can pick off things leaf by leaf. So even as your loosened strands start to mature and there is fibre, <laughs> excuse me, within that um, plant, lambs can very effectively nip off the leaf and the, I suppose the higher digestible lower fibre component of that plant. So even with all of the right things out and available for sheep, you can often see cases of bloat and, and those cases uh, are particularly best managed by the moving of stock on and off those paddocks or locking it up for a few weeks until the um, paddock properties change. That can be tricky on farm depending on the other um, pasture and species availability that you have, um, but fibre is really important in those instances. Cattle more particularly take a big mouthful wider muzzle level, so if you have uh, more maturity in your loosen and available fibre they would tend to be able to manage themselves a little bit more effectively. Uh, in terms of the photos here, um, my little circle has moved, apologies, but um, this is a um, esophagus from an animal that has died from bloat. Uh, this top section here is the part of the esophagus that sits forward of the chest cavity, uh, and this lower part of the esophagus obviously runs through the chest cavity and into the abdomen. And you can see the difference um, basically where the congestion of the, the cranial part of the body from bloat has caused a traditional, what we call a bloat line here. So um, very indicative on post-mortem, uh, I suppose, in terms of differentiating between pulpy kidney um, and other causes of rapid uh, blowing up of the body. Valera staggers, uh, not something we commonly see in cattle, um, but a lot of cases seen across the region in both sheep and cattle this autumn. Uh, some later season cases have still been seen. Uh, we essentially had a, a large amount of biomass in Valera's dominant pastures build up uh, in our early summer season, and then that became a very uh, water-stressed uh, commodity as we got through uh, to autumn. So. A high risk then with a little bit of undergrowth uh, in terms of that plant maintaining its indole alkaloid content and being a high risk for causing Valeris staggers in essentially sheep and cattle this year. 
Uh, important to note, I suppose, your grazing management in that essence, you want to try and not put hungry stock on uh, over um, overwintered or uh, uh, essentially mature ungrazed strands of Phalaris, that is when it's at its highest risk. Um, sometimes that requires slashing or crush grazing with a number, a large number of mouths to open up that lower level, uh, get some fresh growth coming through and, and alternatively in Phalaris dominant pastures, uh, open up the canopy so that you can get some other species germinating and dilute out that impact of Phalaris within that pasture. Important to note here that the brain changes uh, resulted from the indole alkaloid content do cause a permanent brain change. So while you may stop seeing cases uh, developing in a grazing enterprise, uh, when put under stress or moved through yards, those animals may exhibit signs again in the future. There's been a lot of discussion this year, especially around cobalt supplementation uh, within an animal. Um, at the time of clinical signs, there is no significant change in the progression or obviously correction of those clinical signs. There has been some focus this year on top dressing pastures with cobalt uh, direct application over those. And the principle behind that is to reduce the alkaloid within the plant, um, but the efficacy of both uh, intra-animal and uh, pasture top dressing is questionable in terms of reducing risk and clinical signs. Low calcium diets are a very common thing that we see in the Riverina and, and that typically is in our grazing cereal uh, crops. Uh, it also coincides at a time of year where we have particularly low daylight length or often overcast conditions. Uh, vitamin D is really important for absorption of calcium out of the diet. So where we have the combination of a low calcium diet and a low vitamin D, environment, uh, we increase our risk of seeing hypocalcemia or rickets in young lambs in particular. Additional to this, you will also have some poor growth rates uh, in light potentially of no clinical signs of either. Um, calcium is really important for growth and development, as we know. Um, so all of our cereal crops are deficient in calcium. That will vary depending on the variety and, and various soil and plant interactions. But Normal requirement for growth and development is two parts calcium to one part phosphorus. And the, the discrepancy that we see in these cereal crops is anywhere from 1.5 to 1.8 parts calcium. So supplementation with lime is important whenever we're grazing cereals. There are particular plants that have antagonistic um, effects on calcium within them, things like kikuya and buffalo grass, which we don't have a lot of down here in Riverina, but they they have adequate calcium within them. But um, and alkaloid within those plants prevents it from being absorbed out of the diet by livestock. We don't see a lot of hypocalcemia in our beef cattle. Uh, it, it isn't an uncommon presentation in especially Jersey dairy cattle, um, but not a common thing that we see clinically in our beef cattle. But it's important to note that short feed and in particular short crop, which is often what we carve down on at this time of year, is both low in calcium, but also really low in fibre. And fibre is really important during the rumination process helping to draw calcium back out of the diet. Where we have uh, in our um, beef cattle operation is a condition we refer to colloquially as lazy carving. So if there's ineffective amount of calcium um, floating around in circulation, this has a big impact on smooth muscle contraction, which essentially delays um, an effective contraction of getting the little calf out. And so if you are having very healthy calves born dead or a lot of calves born to cows that are stained in meconium as the focus, as the photo is, sorry, to the right of screen, then that little animal's been stressed uh, prior to coming out. And that is likely due to a delay in the birthing process. So important in those environments that we supplement with fiber and calcium uh, to ensure that our cows have got the right environment to, to carve normally. Hoof health is always an important one to note. It's something that we look at all year round, but um, temperature, moisture, pasture availability all have impacts on what we're going to see 
in feet and I suppose severity of disease. It's important for your trade lambs or selling off your lambs if they're really wet in spring. We often see cases of uh, strawberry foot rot or scabby mouth where we see uh, lesions around the lips and mouth in those instances. They cause quite a profound lameness. Um, there is a viral component to them, um, which can be zoonotic. So um, some gloves on if you need to pick up and have a look at little feet that look like this. Um, but we particularly see uh, this viral outbreak when, um, when we have wet springs and lots of trade lambs with some compromised immune functions. Um, not uncommon for most producers in River Arena to see a little bit of sweat between those toes on a beautiful clover pasture with some nice spring sunshine and, and a little bit of moisture. Um, causes a production loss for sure. Uh, most people have a management program on farm for their, their scald or sweating between the toes can cause quite a profound lameness without causing any underrunning to the hard horn of the foot. Um, but particularly important to notice in terms of, um, of managing your production systems. And obviously these pictures over to the right, no one wants to see them and, and hopefully hopefully you don't see them on farm. This sort of underrunning is a, a nastier bacteria. As we all know, cold foot rot, virulent foot rot. Um, and yeah, pending our conditions, um, we may or may not see some feet that look like this this spring. Uh, and if you require us to give you some assistance to make the differentiation between all the above or otherwise, then um, yeah, please reach out to the team. So on that note, I'll pop this little slide up to let you know where all our DVs are across the region. Um, and if you have any animal queries or concerns or want to run through any of the topics or otherwise discussed today, then please reach out to any of the members of the team for further advice. Thank you, Em. That was great. I will now like to pass it over to you all for any burning questions that you may have for our presenters. Feel free to raise your hand or we'll allow you to turn your microphones on now as well. I'm going to start, Bree, if that's all right. Go I've got ahead. one for Em. One, I can't, we can't ever compete with the, um, with the vet photos, the photos from the vets. I know it's lunchtime on a Friday, but you always have impressive photos. Um, I, I'm just wondering, there's probably um, some people out there, I'm just thinking of myself, where some of my cows might have missed a, um, a, a drench uh, for fluke in autumn, and I'm sure in the sheep situation as well, if people got busy feeding um, and sort of took their, their eye off drenching at the moment, is there anything that we need to be specifically focused on now coming to spring to make up for those drenches, or are we better off in a sheep situation doing a worm test and addressing that issue now and in the cattle situation just going back to our normal drench programs? Yeah essentially uh, I would would always base my decisions for sheep off a worm egg count or fecal egg count interchangeable. Yeah. Um, they are less representative in cattle depending on lots of other variables like uh, type of feed and fecal throughput uh, so they're not as easy to rely on in a cattle sense in terms of, of identifying um, whether fluke is an issue or not, uh, blood testing you can do for fluke. Uh, you will end up potentially with a positive result still out to, I think it's out to about eight weeks um, after drenching. So if you're confident you need to, to treat for fluke and then you're testing whether it worked or not, you need to test well and truly outside of that eight to 12 week period to confirm that you drench worked otherwise you may have some carryover from um, a prior infection that you've already treated. Uh, mm -hmm. There is the the sort of standard A's that we talk about in terms of treating for fluke and that's your April and August so consideration to what livestock are looking like now and what your I suppose normal protocols are on farm for treating for fluke um, and worm boss is certainly a really good resource um, available on the internet. Um, Yep. to make those decisions particular to your farm and your region. Yep. Cool. Righty. Has anyone else got any questions? Feel free to pop it in the Q&A or raise your hand. That's all good. 
before you shut down, I know you don't want to talk anymore, but I will, is that uh, I just want to say a huge big thanks to, to Carrie and Brianna for pulling this together. Um, as some of you will be aware, as part of their um they're, they're here for 12 months on on a, on a graduate program and uh it's it's a sort of major project and um and i'd really encourage you all i know they're going to ask you to do a survey at the end i'd really encourage you all to to complete the survey because we want to understand how we can better service our, our customers um landholders in the riverina better um and, and share it with others so basically sort of saying our extension team's open open for business and uh we'd like to be addressing your needs more more than we have in the past so please complete the survey and a big congrats to Carrie and, and Brianna. Thank you. Just want to say a quick thank you to Michael and Em for sharing your knowledge with us today and a big thank you to you all for taking time out of your day to join our webinar. If you could please take a moment to fill out our evaluation survey, we would greatly appreciate it. Simply just scan the QR code on the screen or click on the link. Um, it should take you only less than a minute and it will give us a great opportunity to make any improvements for future webinars. I hope you have all gotten something valuable out of today's webinar. Have a great afternoon and weekend and we look forward to seeing you at future events. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Em. Thanks, Gary. <laughs>